My name is Jessica Gonzalez and I'm with the National Hispanic Media Coalition. I thank you so much for being here today and I'm really looking forward to a lively panel discussion. Just to give you an idea of, of how this is all going to go down, we are going to, I'm going to briefly introduce you to these folks. As luck has it, I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to let them do the majority of the speaking. And then, um, and then I'm going to popcorn some questions out to them. But I really want to leave at least 20 minutes at the end of the session to hear from you, hear your comments and your questions for the distinguished panelists we have here today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce them. Our first speaker, all the way up down on the end there, is my boss, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, Alex Nogales. <laughs> to his left, we have the co-founder and CEO of Oakland-based nonprofit and strategic media production company, The Working Group, Patrice O'Neill. <laughs> to her left is a new media organizer who is the co-founder of Presente.org, a U.S.-based nationwide organization dedicated to political empowerment for Latinos via the internet and mobile messaging. <laughs> And last but not least, we have author, blogger, filmmaker, and journalist who has helped create hundreds of television productions and films and has been the executive in charge of two award-winning broadcast news magazines, Rory O'Connor. I'd like to give each of these folks just a minute or two for them to introduce themselves more fully, to introduce the work that they do, and how it relates to today's topic of changing the narrative, fighting back against misinformation, hate, and demonization in the media. So, so maybe we can start right here with you, Ron. Okay, fine. Check. This is working, here we go. Thank you. So, there's a lot of media makers here at this conference, which is great, and I think like most of them, it's fair to say, uh, I at least got into the media originally because I wanted to do something about the problems of the world. But in short order, I discovered that the media was one of the problems in the world. Stand up, okay? So, uh, I started doing something about that. And uh, this is something that actually came out of our very own work. You know, we did those two series. One was South Africa Now, about the liberation of South Africa. And the follow-up was Rights and Wrongs, about human rights around the world. We found, to our astonishment, that not only was no commercial broadcast television outlet interested in those shows, but public television wasn't interested, or PBS, I should say, wasn't interested either. So there were gatekeepers on both the corporate and the public side that were actually preventing us, putting up a gate between us and our audience. So we went to the internet early on in 1999. We started a website called themediachannel.org to begin dealing with these very issues. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see, you know, like 12 years later, there's thousands of people here in Boston who've gotten the message that the media is one of the problems of the world. So for me, as I say, it came very much out of my own personal experience of being frustrated by the media system, getting in the way of us telling our stories to an audience that clearly wanted to hear them. Now, what happened in the 10 years since then uh, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things. You all know about the tools and technology. What happened for me, or what's relevant to today, is I started writing a, a column for Alternate, uh, the progressive news service, and started writing about some of these knuckleheads on the radio who, you know, frankly, a lot of people, particularly in the progressive uh, community, were not paying much attention to at the time. And what I found was what they were doing was hateful, and a lot of people just weren't aware of it. So I started writing a lot about it, in 2008, I wrote this book about it called Shock Jocks, Hate Speech and Talk Radio. So I'll just wrap up by saying I'm really pleased to be here today. I want to thank the coalition. Honestly, I had proposed a panel on hate speech in the media for three or four years, uh, but I'm not a very good organizer, I guess, so I didn't get a lot of votes, whatever you need to do to get a panel. So I'm really great, glad that they organized because I think this is a very important issue and I also think it's an issue that the tide is turning and the progressive forces are now starting, starting to win. 
I like how you said the tide is turning because that's actually what uh, Lou Dobbs said with it on his last uh, on his last address. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, no, that's what uh, that's what Lou Dobbs said on his last address after uh, a three-month campaign that many organizations here were a part of, um, including uh, the organization that I helped co-found, Presente.org. If somebody could take that really high-tech thing right there and like move it, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, what was really unique about uh, Presente.org is that, as many of you may remember, in 2006, when millions of immigrants and Latinos were marching in the street, uh, what many people don't remember is that we did not have a very sophisticated email infrastructure that we were communicating through. I mean, Move On was not really uh, touching, uh, even talking about the immigration uh, marches. And at the same time, while we were all listening to radio and we may have emailed informally, we did not have an infrastructure with which to uh, talk to each other on a nationwide level in a way in the model of online organizing and so Presente.org was born out of that need and in the last we, we, we started in 2009 and since we started we've taken on uh, campaigns everything from the campaign to remove Lou Dobbs from CNN precisely for the kind of language that he would say calling immigrants uh, saying that we were murderers and rapists and that we had leprosy and allowing people like the Minutemen to be on his show you know the same Minutemen that killed nine-year-old Liseña Flores, you know? And so what we were doing is, as Latinos, as the boys coming from Latinos, in both English and Spanish, saying that, you know, not only is hate media literally causing uh, death in our communities and is having a very profound effect, but also, what are the solutions we're working towards, right? How do we get away from criminalization and hate towards legislation, acceptance? The reality is, is that 50,000 Latinos every month are 18 years old. We are the future of this country, and so part of combating hate is us having confidence and self-esteem so that we can take the country forward. You know, and be better. And, and so, uh, combating hate is a big part of what we do in our work, precisely because we're about pushing positive images about Latinos. And so, the campaigns we've taken on around hate, which have gone national, include the campaign against the dogs, where we uh, signed up over 100,000 users protest John Klein at CNN and eventually get him moved to calling out for justice for Vicenia Flores and pushing the main networks to talk about her story, uh, to push him for the resignation of Peck for the statements that he made and getting our members to help fund some of these ads that go on the radio to inform uh, all of our people of what's happening. So I'm very excited about the work we do. Not only are we using technology, we're incorporating arts, pop culture, um, and uh, youth power. So when you're forced to, as many, many people are, you decide to set your eyes on hate, it, there's so much darkness that it's really easy to get swallowed up. And I, I really want to thank everyone for coming to this panel today to address this very challenging issue. We Googled hate crimes, and, and this morning I just wanted to see what was there, and I, I saw the story of a group of children in Staten Island who attacked one of their Muslim classmates. A gay man who had been beaten up on a municipal bus. And the story of five people who were indicted in Arkansas for setting fire to an interracial couple's home. So each of these stories represent a moment of horror for the people who experience it. But, but the ripple of that is tremendous in every community. Can you imagine every girl who wears her job in that school? Or, or every gay person who's thinking about getting on a bus, or everyone who dares to love someone who's a, a different race. Just the ripples are tremendous. But in the midst of all this darkness, we get to tell another story of love our town. We are telling the stories. We are upending the coverage of hate and looking at the people who want to do something about it, the people who are ready to change, the people who want to, to, want to make their communities safe and welcoming for everyone. So Not In Our Town was launched in 1995 with a film that we did about how people in Billings, Montana resisted hate crimes. And the essential message of the story is that each one of us can play a role in changing our community. That small acts by each of us, or sometimes brave acts by each of us, depending on what our skills are, whether we're, we're media makers or whether we're, we're store owners or whether we're police, whatever we are, can make a difference in our communities. 
we um, we launched a campaign where we had we thought we'd do ten town hall meetings around the country, showing this film to encourage discussions about about what people could do in their own town. Ever since then, we've been covering that story, and just recently we launched a new site called niamp.org, notnartown.org, where we tell their stories. The map is an example of um, red dots represent where hate crimes are happening, but the green dots represent stories of action and community change. So there's a way for you to connect with people who are taking action. In the so um, that you know, that is the world that I live in, that I try to cover. It's not just the stories of hate, but it's people trying to do something about it. And I and I hope that we can sort of push this forward in the discussion about what we do about hate speech and, and really see the right in all that part of us. Thank you. Buddy, I'm Alex Novak. This is um, a very gratifying the fact that there's a lot of not Latinos here in the audience. Years ago, it was a Latino talking to Latinos about the same problem. And now we see a lot of other people outside the whole community who are doing the same thing because of here. Become very acceptable to the anti Latino, the anti gay, the anti African American. I'm a little bit older than the majority of people. I come from a generation that saw signs up and down the state of California to depict the different things you see. They said no dogs or Mexicans are not allowed. It's very common. You can just imagine the marginalization that goes along with it. Things have not been this bad since I was a kid. Things have got it completely out of control. I'm very gratified to have these people up here uh, with me at the podium because it represents a cross-section of people coming at the same problem in different ways. The National Hispanic Media Coalition filed a petition of inquiry at the Federal Communications Commission to see the relationship that we know exists between hate speech and hate crimes. That was two years ago. We still have not gotten the FCC to act on this matter. At the same time, we went to the NTIA, National Telecommunications and uh, Information Administration, and asked them to update a report that was issued in 1992 called the Role of Telecommunications in Hate Crimes. This has not happened also. But right now, there is such a groundwell of support to take action with this issue we're very hopeful that things are going to occur and they're going to occur very, very quickly. At the same time as we're doing these petitions and we're going around the country talking to allies, Latino and non-Latino, we have issued or we have commissioned three reports with the UCLA Chicano Research Center to explore the relationship between hate speech and hate crimes. Two of, the, of those reports are already done. We're waiting for the third. It'll be done, all three of them within the next couple of months. And that, I think, will spur this issue to bubble up more to the surface. As you know, before a terrible massacre of people in Tucson, uh, people were talking about it, but they were not really taking action. In talking to a congressional people, we see a big change. They're interested. They want to do now something about it. So we're going to consist, uh, to persist in forcing the powers that be to take this to the next step. And by that I mean the Federal Communications Commission and the FBIA. We need relief. And just as the opposition has the right to say whatever they want to say practically, anything that they want to say on radio and on television, we as a society, as a community, have the right to object and put our forces to it. And that's what we're going to do. I think it might be helpful to back up and talk about how we are defining hate speech. We get this question all the time, and uh, depending on where you're coming from, you might see it differently. So I pose this to anyone who wants to comment on the panel. How do you define hate speech? And how is that definition different or similar to how you define misinformation and dehumanization? What is hate speech? Because I think there is a legal definition uh, which obviously varies from country to country. Uh, and then there's a common sense definition. The legal definition in the United States is very tight. Uh, it's defined as imminent incitement to violence. So for example, if you're Rush Limbaugh 
and in uh, April you're calling for riots at the Democratic National Convention in June, that's not legal hate speech because it's two months away. It's not an imminent incitement to violence. So in the United States, we have very narrow uh, definition, legal definition. We have a lot of uh, free speech and First Amendment issues. But I would also say that everybody in this room, you know, to paraphrase what a Supreme Court justice once said in another context about pornography, you know, I know it when I hear it. And I think you all know it when you hear it, and particularly egregious when we hear it on the public airwaves, which we own. Uh, and what I'm talking about is deliberately a, a dehumanization, uh, objectification, marginalization of human beings and largely of groups of human beings who are uh, vulnerable in our society. So who is most ordinarily attacked? It's the people that Patrice was talking about. It's, it's women. They're the feminazis out there. Uh, it's uh, homosexuals. It's ethnic minorities. Uh, and this, you know, we all know what hate speech is when we hear it. Uh, the question is, what are we going to say in response? Anyone else care to venture a definition? I, I, I think Rory's right about the legal definition and what's allowed in the Constitution and what we hear and, and what we know. And I think for those of us who sort of live in this realm, I think it's, it's a constant challenge. You know, do you call this hate speech? Do you call this dehumanization? How do you deal with it? Um, I, I do think that there are constant chat. Um, stand up, sorry. I think there are constant tests on the Constitution. I, you know, I find that hate speech is becoming so challenging in our country now that we we need to look at sort of some of the limits that we've already placed on on free speech, like you can't cry fire in a crowded. I think at a certain moment, and what that moment is, I think is a challenge for all of us. Things become so dangerous and so difficult that there may be limits on speech. And I'm not advocating limiting free speech. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think there are moments, sir, sorry. So I do think there are moments when, when agitation, dehumanization, hate speech becomes so dangerous that we really have to look at it. And I, you know, I think it's a really dynamic conversation for us to look at. It. European countries like Germany have very different, they have a very different tradition, um, but also very different experience in how they deal with hate speech is also very different. I mean, we, we deal with this, and I, I, you know, I won't talk any longer about this, but we deal with this on our blog and, and on our site very often. What are we gonna allow on the site? What are we not? You know, for us, it's much clearer. We are a site for people who are fighting hate. So if you're going to be, if you're going to make dehumanizing comments, sorry, not on the blog. So, but I think the other, um, the other newspapers are quite challenged by this. And I, I do think it's a dynamic conversation. That it's not like this is it, and that's the definition of it, and we don't cross any boundaries. I think it's dynamic, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Do you think that hate speech is prevalent in the media or that exists on the periphery? And can you give an example of hate speech that you've seen or heard from where you observed it? As I said before, hate speech is very, very prevalent. It isn't an accident that a congresswoman in Tucson, Arizona was shot at. When you use words such as, we're going to target this person and so forth, it means something. Words do have consequences. They do have a meaning. I was just telling Joaquin here a few minutes ago that in um, San Antonio, an area that he knows very well in Texas, um, there was a basketball game the other day, and you had a predominantly Mexican-American uh, team uh, playing against a predominantly non-Latino team. The crowd that was mostly white started to chant USA, USA. Now, who is USA? And then when that petered out, they started saying Arizona, chanting Arizona, Arizona, Arizona. These are the kinds of things that are going on across the country. Now these are the mild ones that become acceptable with our children. But you know, if you hear the bombardment of this kind of speech throughout the day, you know very well that people are going to get hurt, and they have been hurt, not only 
violated in terms of assaults, in terms of, uh, of uh, rapes, in terms of these kinds of things. The people are losing their lives because you have nice kids who otherwise would never act on those kinds of impulses going out into the community, picking on someone that they think is here without documentation, and assaulting them. Well, when that person has five or six or eight people coming at him, he's going to fight back. And in many instances, death is the result. So it's become acceptable, all of, all of this to say that it's become acceptable to look at Latinos across this nation in a certain way that means it's all right to assault them, it's all right to offend them, it's all right to go against this community. And that's exactly what we're experiencing across the nation. We were talking a moment ago, we were just saying between ourselves, you know, it's become so acceptable to have these kinds of views. So I'm so glad again that all of you are here. I'm so glad that so many of you are not minority because we can't just have this conversation within the minority communities. We have to have it with the entire American people. Well, I'm glad you asked for examples. I'll give you a couple of recent ones, and, and it leads to another point that I like to make, which is that this is not a right-left issue, which is often posed as. Now, it is true on AM Talk Radio the predominance of the programming is conservative. So much, most of the hate speech is, is coming from conservatives. But I gotta tell you, when Randy Rhodes, who's a liberal uh, radio host, calls uh, Senator, then Senator Clinton a hoe, I don't find that any more acceptable when, than when Don Imus uses that to talk about the Rutgers basketball team. Or when Bill Maher, I don't know if he's right, left, or what, calls Sarah Palin a twat, which he did a week ago, and then gets up and defends it, I think it's incumbent on us to oppose that as well. None of it is acceptable discourse. It's not a political issue, and it's not a censorship issue, which is some, the first question I always get when I speak out on this is, why, are you, why do you want to censor them? I don't want to censor them. I want to combat them. I want to use our free speech and our other First Amendment rights, like freedom of assembly to picket the stations and boycott the advertisers and all the tools at our disposal, as Alex said, to stand up and say, this is not only is this not acceptable, this is not America. Because I got news for you, this is a majority issue that we're on the right side of. Most people know hate speech when they hear it, even if they can't define it. And most people are not in favor of it, okay? So I think we need to recognize that. And when people come up and say, why are you censoring? Why are you being so PC is another question I get all the time. We need to confront them. And then the final point that I want to make is that it's really important to recognize victories and to learn from the victories. And there have been victories. You know, Don Imus was driven off the air. Okay, he's back. But he was driven off. <coughs> Glenn Beck lost his advertisers and lost his network. And there are other examples as well. So. This is, a, you know, again, what Patrice and Alex are talking about is this is a broad-based issue, I think. It's one that we can win, and that we're starting to win, but now is the time not to have everybody be in their silo and say, you know, I'm a gay, I'm a Hispanic, or whatever. You know, we should be in this room maybe chanting USA, okay? Because Americans do not support this. And if we take a leadership role and get up there and call it out, I think it's a winning issue. May I add one more thing to this? You're, you're the boss, Alex. <laughs> Do whatever you want. She may act that way very subservient. But that's not really her personality. That's what side is, is personality. Is that. We were over at Senator Rockefeller's office a few days ago. And we have a petition excuse me, a complaint against a show in Spanish called Jose Luis in Censura. Some of you may know that particular show. Jerry Springer is nothing compared to what these people are putting on here. Really anti-hate, anti-gay, lesbian, transgender, anti-women kind of language day in, day out. Encouraging the audience to go onto the stage and beat up the people that they don't like. 
Now, I should tell you, he made the connection between this complaint that we have, along with Goliath incident, he made the connection to hate speech immediately. I didn't want to go there because it takes us from one place to another, but rightfully, he did the same thing. Hate speech is hate speech, whether it's in Spanish or in English, whether it's against gays, African Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, or anybody else. It's hate speech. And you know, I like your definition. We all know it when we hear it. Because, come on, we all know it when we hear it. A lot of the time when we're doing our work, um, we come across folks who don't agree with us, and they ask this question. And I'd like to pick your brains on how I should answer it next time I'm asked. Why are you so concerned about this? If you don't like it, can't you just change the channel? Can't you just click off of that website? You know, why should the government be involved? This is free speech, and if you don't like it, just look the other way. What, what do you say to that? First off, I'm really excited that uh, Color of Change, which is the sister organization to Presenta.org, was the responsible group for getting 300 advertisers off of Glenn Beck. It was over <laughs> You know, when, when we think of our campaigns, Part of it is how we, we message it. And so with, unfortunately, with these you know, large multinational media corporations, it's really about their bottom line. I mean, with Lou Dobbs, the, the way that we were able to get John Klein to pay attention is to say, hey, do you really want a growing Latino market to not watch CNN? We know you have Latinos in America. We know you have Soledad O'Brien. So Lou Dobbs doesn't really align with your uh, entry into the Latino market, and it was it was about their their bottom line. However, I think that when we're speaking with um, our community in general, even just uh, Americans overall, we have to also talk about where this country is headed and the changing demographics. Because if we begin to translate the the hate talk, also translates into policy, it translates into legislation. And so when you look at we're in the middle of the cuts to the public sector, and that's cuts to education system cuts to WIC programs for mothers. It's no coincidence that a lot of those cuts, the children facing those cuts, are going to be, in many states, majority Latino kids. So how do you justify kind of a, a hate uh, environment where that also <coughs> begins to translate into policy that begins also cutting from these Latino kids that you have learned to dehumanize and therefore don't care to cut their education, don't care that if they're getting tracked into the prison system and their parents don't have adequate um, health services to take care of them. And yet, these are the same Latino kids that are going to take us into the next century. So how do we get all Americans to understand that they have to be bought in and we have a responsibility and a stake in making sure that the future of this country is not only well-educated but has a very strong sense of self um, and is about embracing a multicultural majority that is going to help them be better decision makers in this country. That's something that benefits us all. And so I think that we we have to learn how to take translate the hate speech into the actual policies that we are seeing, the cuts to the public sector, and how the private sector is completely getting away with robbing uh, all of us. Anyone else on why not to just change the channel? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to address it. I think there's two main reasons. Number one is it's my airwaves. Okay, and I don't want this crap on it. We own these airwaves. These are public, the publicly owned airwaves. That's issue number one. But issue number two is because what people don't realize is that these shock jocks are still incredibly powerful. And let's just take a moment. We're here with the coalition. Let's go back to two, June of 2007. Okay? You may not remember, but the Republicans were in ascendance. They had the president, Mr. Bush. They had control of the Supreme Court, of course, and they controlled both houses of Congress. And there was a little thing called a bipartisan immigration bill that was supported by all the Republicans and all of the Democrats. June of 2007 is when the bill was filed. Okay, good point. So the Republicans only controlled the Supreme Court, the presidency, and the Senate. At that point, you're right. Excuse me. Uh, my point is, all the Republicans, majority leaders, 
all the minority leaders, every, all the politicians supported it, it was bipartisan. Did the bill pass? No. The bill was killed almost exclusively because of the power of the shock jocks who organized around it, who rebranded it as something called shamnesty, as you may recall, but moreover, they went on the offensive with their audience. What did they do? Well, first of all, Rush Limbaugh said that not only are Mexican migrants in the country uh, poor and unwilling to work, but they're a renegade criminal element. Michael Savage dubbed the immigration bill the I bomb and said, I'm gonna threat I'm going to derail this train of treason. So what do you think uh, the, their listeners did? Oh, let me tell you about Bill O'Reilly, okay? Bill O'Reilly said that they're trying to flood the country with foreign nationals to change the complexion, pardon the pun, of America. And on and on. So, but my point is they organized their constituencies. What did they do? They sent threatening emails to sitting Republican uh, senators. Mel Martinez himself, an immigrant, was receiving letters at home saying, change your vote or we're going to take you out by any means necessary. And Senator Richard Barr, also Republican, North Carolina, turned his letters over to the FBI. So they literally were threatening the U.S. senators with death. And they were pounding away, as you know, daily in a coordinated way. And the shock jocks, who everybody says, oh, why are you so PC? Why are you making such a big deal about this? You don't like it. Change the channel. Killed bipartisan immigration reform in this country for years, and we still have a huge problem, and we have no chance of it getting uh, solved in Washington for the foreseeable future. So that's why it's important. Now, you all know how difficult, those of you that have children, or those of you that are young enough to remember that when you turned on the television, there was no, no one there to tell you you couldn't or you could, simply because. Television is right there. Now, I want to refer back to the complaint that we have against the Lieberman Corporation, who is the responsible party for Cosa Grisim Samsuga. They started what is called pornographic radio, radio pornografia, in Los Angeles, something like 12 years ago. And we did a petition to deny or to um, uh, take away their license. And the reason we did that was because they were broadcasting exactly at the time that is considered a safe harbor by the FCC in relation to our kids, okay? The stuff that they were broadcasting was way out there. Now, understand, I'm the last one to uh, want to have anyone censor my, my want or need or whatever uh, to see whatever I want to see. However, when it comes to our children, it's a whole different story. We need good sex education. Not a kind of filth that they were putting on the air, the kind of uh, misinformation that they were putting on the air. Now, I went to see Leonard Lieberman, who was at that point was still there as a CEO and president of that organization. And I said to him in the heat of the moment, how would you like it if your children were listening to this stuff day in, day out? He said to me, my children would never do that because I have people around that would never allow them to do that. In other words, the pendejos are us. Those of us that can't afford to have someone, you know, monitor what is going on, we're screwed. Because he is protected, his children are protected, they're not going to know that though, but ours are. And the fact of the matter is that that's a silly argument. Broadcast television, you don't even have to have cable, it's right there. And kids are going to be switching channels day in, day out, and listening to whatever is on the air. And you know very well, if something is scintillating, we're all going to listen to it to some degree, especially children. I'd, I'd like to just take a moment and hear some of you described in, in some detail what you've been doing about it, but I would like to hear what you and your organizations are doing to change the narrative, fight hate, misinformation, and dehumanization in the media. I'd also be curious to know if you think there are other things that you're not doing that we should be doing. I'm going to use my time to show a clip from um, our latest film, which will air in September on PBS. It's called uh, Our Town Life in the Darkness. And it's, we've been watching for 
almost eight years now, this rise in anti-immigrant violence across the country. But as I said, our, our lens on this is community response. Where can we find those models? Where is their action? Where is there something for people to grab onto? Some kind of leadership, community action that they pay. And I think many of you have heard about what happened in Suffolk County. Here's a little clip from the film, the trailer. Saturday night, my understanding was about 10 to 12, 5 to 12, when the call came into the ambulance company, that there was a man in the street that had been stabbed and was bleeding, bleeding to death. The defendants, each and every one of them, readily agreed to go looking for Mexicans to beat up. Conroy, the defendant who has been charged in this case with murder, took out a knife that he had in his pocket, ran towards Marcelo with his arms extended, and plunged the knife into Marcelo Lucero's chest. This is the knife that killed Marcelo Lucero. The detective came over to my house and told me, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your brother got killed last night. And I'm, I'm the first thing I take my cell phone and I call him. And they was reading the phone and they don't answer. So I try it again. I was saying, no, you're wrong. You, that, that's, that's not, that's not, you're wrong. So I call him the second time and he told me, he's not gonna answer your phone because we have his phone. He's dead. El sufrimiento es tan grande que ya... No sé. Yo mismo pienso y no acabo y le pido a Dios que me conforme. Porque hay momentos que se llena, me llena de desesperación. A veces lloro en silencio. Porque la pena es tan grande de perder a mi hijo. El corazón se hace pedazos de saber de perder a un hombre lleno de vida como estaba él. What happened at the spot that we stand right now, where Marcelo Lucero was killed, is a tragedy that will forever change this community. It, it will change how I look and how I do my job. And I have to be the one for this community that must show the leadership to how we're going to change and make this a safe place for people to be. That's a tough act to follow. Anyone else, anyone else want to share what they've been doing about this issue? Um, well, I, I would like to say that doing uh, documentaries and sharing the stories of people who are affected, like sharing uh, Briseña's story, like sharing this story, like sharing the story of Luis Ramirez, who was the 18-year-old who was kicked to death. Uh, while they were kicking him, they were calling him the wetback. It's a part, it's definitely a part of how we get people to understand the humanity um, behind this, you really understand. Because in the, in the rhetoric and the hate rhetoric, what's really happening is that you know, <coughs> immigrants especially get seen as subhuman, which then justifies uh, at time violence like this, but also laws like SB 1070, or even the fact that the Obama administration is deporting over a thousand immigrants a day, and that even to challenge that somehow 
becomes a much more difficult task because immigrants are so dehumanized in, in, in the media. Uh, at Presente, we launch campaigns that are about uh, responding to these things immediately as they happen. For example, responding to Virgil Peck's comments when he said that immigrants should be shot like hogs. Uh, and we also are looking at ways to have a, 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 to really kind of shift the narrative for the long term. So, for example, how can we begin to organize musicians and visual artists and writers, people like Juno Diaz or the Shepherd Fairies of the world or the Pearl Jam, the Radioheads, to speak out on this so that they can educate this growing, you know, young voter base that is going to be making the decisions and is going to be able to do some of this, right? And um, if you think about the case, for example, of Matthew Shepherd who was the gay youth who was beat to death in 1998, you didn't see any kind of legislative, um, any legislation addressing that until 2009. You know, and so the politics is very slow to follow, but culture is where you see the transformation because the Matthew Shepard Project released the Laramie play, the Laramie Project, which now is one of the most practiced plays in the United States. You, in high schools, the Laramie Project is one of the most popular plays. And that is a really powerful cultural tool to changing the narrative around violence against young gay men. We need those kinds of tools in the immigrant rights movement. How do we use culture so that we're able to, to say in the next five or 10 years, you know, do you really want to be like that uncool Russell Pierce, Rush Limbaugh dude? Or do you want to be like, you know, do you want to be part of this generation that's really accepting, that's moving towards legalization and really understand that as humans, instead of hating each other, we need to be you know, working on climate change, or how do we really build our country? So um, at Presente, we look at ways to engage culture in, in a, a more long-term transformation. I'm so excited. I can't wait to work with you on the release of this film, because I think your point is well taken. We don't just want to put this film out there and have people look at it. I think the point is to open up a conversation in communities among people not necessarily those who are all convinced, et cetera, but a discussion among people about how we treat each other, how we talk to our neighbors, et cetera. And we're so looking forward to talking to all of you and engaging you and having you grab this film and run with it and use it in your town to open up a discussion. Because I think that's the point. That's what you're saying about culture, art, film, stories. How do we connect with people emotionally so this, this story becomes real so that People like the Lucero family become real, and we can have a conversation and look at each other. And say, well, what do we do now? And let's let's start doing it. Well, one last point I want to make is: what what do I do? I, I write, I blog, I, I speak, and people ask me. I make films, I make videos. You know, I agitate on this subject, but uh, I also get a lot back. You know, first of all, I mean a lot of fantastic people who are already engaged in combating this. And I also uh, learned a tremendous amount. So for example, I was, I was asked to come to a place I'd never been uh, two years ago, uh, a little town called Tucson, Arizona. And I'm like, okay, and I've never been there, which is one of the ways I decide you know, what I accept. But I was invited by a local group called Derechos Humanos, uh, and they were concerned about a local shock jock. He was local, I'd never heard of him. He went under the name of John Justice. Maybe, maybe you've heard of him, okay? So John was making YouTube videos of him smashing a pinata that looked like a, a human rights activist and, and attorney there named Isabel Garcia, and saying some really disgusting things that I won't repeat here. So, and I, of course, you know, wrote this book. I'm, I'm quote unquote the expert. I had no idea what was going on in Tucson. So I accepted their invitation. I flew down, I, I gave a talk and showed some videos. I met with the people there and I found out, holy cow, what's going on here in Tucson, Arizona is out of control. I can't believe this. I went back, I wrote a blog uh, about what happened. So when Congressman Giffords got a brain, a bullet put through her brain, I went back and looked at the blog that I had written two years ago and it ended by quoting one of these knuckleheads who was opposing the riches humanos by saying that his intention was to take his gun and turn their brains into red mush. Well, it didn't surprise me when two years later somebody else did exactly that. So this is something that I learned about well in advance. So I, I want to say it's also, it can, 
which may be a little strange to say, but it can be uplifting to know that you're not alone. And I, I said before, I truly believe that this is a majority issue, because whenever I talk about it, people from across the spectrum, the vast majority come up and say, I agree with you, I don't uh, support this, and what can I do? So I want to encourage you to go out there and, and you know use your voices as well, because among other things, it gives you hope and makes you feel like, wow, you know, I'm not alone. And I think that's a, a really important message that anybody who's doing this work, or particularly people in the media, you know, like not in our town, I want to say I'm on the board of Patrice's organization, and, and I think it's fantastic. I really recommend all of you going to the website and, and the social network around it, because you're going to meet a lot of really interesting people, and you might even have some fun out of it. With that great lead-in, not to ask, if folks in this audience want to get involved in their local communities, you know we're all we're all from different places here, and some of some of the worst of these hate pundits, I think, are are not on the national dial. We heard uh, John Stokes out of Montana saying, "The Bible says, if they break into your country, chop off their limbs. We have to forcibly get rid of these people. They must be killed." And this was over a local radio station where only folks in that town heard. So, so if you're in the, these towns, how can you, uh, you know, can we connect with you? Or what can we do in our own communities to make sure that we are living in a civil community? We did a film about the community of Kalispell, Montana, where John Stokes is from, and, and about a very dangerous level of of, of rhetoric that was coming out of that local community radio station. And what, what was really interesting to me is that Stokes sort of used his voice to create the sense of community. And people who had been disenfranchised started calling up on the station. It was really interesting how he did that. And we think of what community radio is. He used it in, in such a, a really frightening way. Um, however, I think you know our film sort of talks about this. People in that community did resist. As you gave examples, they, they went after the advertisers, they, they did a whole number of things, and he is now off the air. And you know, I, I think, again, it's important to remember that. And the film's called The Fire Next Time. If you get a chance to see it, I think it's, I think it's up on the web. You can, you can just watch it. But um, you'll see an example of what one, one um, radio job can do to an entire community. ¿Cómo puede ser un chiste sugerir que se maten a inmigrantes desde helicópteros? Esto es exactamente lo que dijo el representante de Kansas, Virgil Peck. Comentarios racistas como este son los que incitan a crímenes de odio. Lo hemos visto ya en todo el país. Y hoy en día los latinos somos el grupo que representa a la mayor cantidad de víctimas de crímenes de odio en los Estados Unidos. ¿Quién podría defender estos comentarios? Lamentablemente, tres representantes de Kansas, todos latinos, todos republicanos, Mario Goico, Reinaldo Mesa y Ramón González. Sigue siendo válido el dicho, dime con quién andas y te diré quién eres. Únete a nuestra campaña para exigir a Goico, Mesa y González que pidan la renuncia de Pe. Envía un mensaje de texto al 30644 con la palabra renuncia. No permitas que hablen por ti. Dile a Goico, Mesa y González que las palabras de Pe no han sido ni olvidadas ni perdonadas.
our numbers are going at, at an incredible rate, so it's important to contextualize what are, what are the possible. We have to engage in this problem in a lot of different sectors. It's not going to be won by any one sector. I really appreciate what the folks up here do, but also what you're going to do. Because, you know, we're not all going to be engaged in a day-to-day -day thing like we are, day in and day out. But the rest of you can make a difference by signing on to letters that are asking for redress, that are asking for justice, that are asking for fairness. So I, I ask you all to commit to yourselves and commit to one another that that's exactly what you're going to do. You all have your talents, you all have your contacts, you all have your network of people that you talk to day in, day out. We need you as well to do the same thing that we're doing. And that is become active in this fight to stop this kind of hatred that is leading this country into more and more hate crimes day in and day out. We also have a take action page on our website, nhmc.org. You can take action. There's a button right on the home page. Patrice, I'm sorry. Sorry for intervening. I want to sort of play off something that's been said by a number of people here. And I think it's important to know at, at least some of the things that we've seen, that there isn't any one political perspective that is ready to resist hate, and that there are people across the political spectrum who reject this. And I think what, what Rory has said is really true. It is an American value. It is a value of our country to resist hate. And if we think that it's coming from only a certain you know, political viewpoint, I think we're really missing the point, and we're missing the opportunity to do something much larger. So we may have disagreements about a lot of things, but um, I think this is a very core value about people sh being able to freely walk the streets safe from hate. And I think that's something, as, as we think about moving forward, something that we should constantly keep in mind, because we have amazing people from very conservative to very liberal who are engaged in our town movement. There's been much debate recently about online anonymity. Some hold it highly valuable, whereas others suggest it leads to poor digital, digital citizenship, including increased hate and misinformation online. Some have suggested that mainstream news organizations should require that their commenters reveal identities if they want to post comments on the sites, as sometimes these are some of the most hateful venues online. So I'm curious to hear, what is your take on this? Is there a value in online anonymity that outweighs uh, digital citizenship? A black and white issue. Uh, for example, if you're an Egyptian revolutionary who's using Facebook, it could be quite dangerous to not be anonymous. Uh, and this is an issue that Facebook is grappling with right now. On the other hand, as you're saying, anonymity, uh, particularly in the comments sections, we all know that that tends to lead people to uh, feel like they can go berserk. Uh, personally, I, and this is only a personal opinion, I'm really up to minds, as I said, but uh, I don't favor, you know, a lot of people have had long time email handles and so on. There are a lot of reasons why people may not want to, you know, have their real name in an email. And I think it's actually incumbent, if you've got a website or a newspaper or something, to very actively police and moderate your comments. Uh, or there are also new technological tools like the, the Discus program and so on. But you have to pay attention to that conversation and not just let it uh, go off the rails and, and get run amok and become a forum for hate speech. But personally, I, I'm not in favor of taking away the anonymity, but I, I can see arguments for it as well. I'm, I'm going to keep you up here for a second with a follow-up question. Say we are the moderators of our online discussion. Where do, where do we draw the line then? Well, I think the first thing is you draw the line because it's your site. As Patrice said, you know, her site is a community site. It's for a community of people who are coming together for a very specific purpose. So if people come on and try to steer the conversation away from the purpose, then you have every right to just, you know, politely go and say, I'm sorry, but you know, that's not what this site is about, and that's not what the comments section is about. There are other places, you know, if you want to talk about that or talk like that, you can go there, but, you know, not in our town, not on our site as well. 
I don't think that you have to say one way or the other, but I'd really like to see some experiments in news organizations, in blogs, etc., with people not being anonymous. And I would like to see how the conversation changes. I, I would love to see news organizations, blogs, do this experiment and say, we're going to see how this affects our conversation. We're going to do it very transparently. And I think we all know what would happen. The conversation would change. And I think that means a lot. I think we need to see that. There's this whole experiment about how we're going to do journalism differently and citizen discussion, et cetera. When you don't have that cloak of anonymity, you don't say the kinds of things that are said day in and day out on blogs and on news sites. And I, you know, I think I would really like to see the so-called mainstream media, um, who is very, you know, feels strongly about the right to free speech as well. We all should, but let's just see what happens when people have to give their names. I hold myself responsible as other people hold me responsible for what I have to say. Everybody should be held responsible for what they have to say. You know, it's too easy now to go anywhere on the internet and see all kinds of postings that are uh, ridiculous, that are offensive, that are full of hate. Uh, we have standards at the FCC regarding radio and television that are not always referred to. But if you look at the internet, we have nothing there to protect us from the crazies out there. I, I favor that, in fact, if we're going to say something, put our name down. Why not? We said it. Why are we going to let anybody off the hook? They can have whatever view they want to have, but when it crosses a line, it crosses a line. There again, we go to that whole thing as I know hate speech when I hear it, okay? So uh, that is my view. I, I don't know what yours is. I hope we're not too far off um, the, the subject. You know, um, she is saying something that also makes sense. Let's try it. Let's see what happens when, in fact, people have to put their names down. And that will change the tenor of the conversation. But for me, I want to go all the way. If I'm held responsible for what I have to say, I want to hold others responsible for what they say as well. I actually fully support online anonymity, and I was on a panel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation about the importance of us maintaining and fighting for our anonymity, for our privacy rights, because when you are logged in, you're in the cloud, and all of our information is being accessed by Google. We need, a, we need some kind of protection. These big medias are having all of our um, all of our data, what we like, and so we need, not only do we need it for our right to privacy, but also in places like Egypt and, and, and in these places where it's dangerous to speak out um, against the government. Even in the United States, in the G20 summit, a Twitterer got um, plucked out and, and arrested because of, of, of something that he said on Twitter. So I, I, definitely, I think that anonymity actually, is, there is a value to it in the sense where we become everyone and of course this, there's two sides to the point of course there's always going to be the negative side to anonymity but the, the on the on the positive side it is about um, our ability to not be monitored our, our our ability to not have our data be tracked um, and our ability to participate in in kind of a democratic uh, a space where we can speak out against whatever forces that be and so in places you know i, I think it was um Got the name where they didn't have a HTTPS and they were telling Google. Uh, no, it was in, in, in the Middle East um, recently. I, 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 no, it wasn't Iran. Uh, Already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tunisia. Sorry. Bingo. Yeah. Um, and the, the folks at Electronic Frontier Foundation told Google, hey, you have to have HTTPS because what the government had done is send out these little JavaScripts so that they were tracking what the opposition, what the, the dissent was saying. I mean, this is this is dangerous stuff. And so one really great thing of the Electronic Frontier Foundation that they, that they were saying is that your rights as a citizen do not stop when you're online. And fighting for those rights being also fighting for our right to have anonymity. And so that's where, where I stand on the issue is that I'm, uh, you know, I think it gets a little tricky because of how much data we're sharing uh, online and that it, it can also become a space for oppression, and we, of course, don't want that.
I want to get to the audience. I just want to make one, one last point on this and then get to the audience. I have several blogs. Uh, one of them, RoryOconna.org, is, is my main one. And unlike a lot of bloggers, I do take comments. You know, a lot of people just shut the comments down. But I take comments because I figure the blog is my chance to talk, and then that's their chance to talk. But when people go off the rails, as they occasionally do, first of all, I delete it. But the second thing is I send them an email. And I say, first of all, thank you very much for commenting on my blog. Uh, I, I want you to know I deleted it because of the ad hominem attack that you uh, said about me, and we don't, uh, I don't have that sort of language. Uh, however, you know, if you want to comment in the future, I'd welcome it as long as you don't do that. And I'll tell you that I'd say 99 out of 100 times, I get a very apologetic email back. And it was simply, so my point is that we're all human, and I think maybe another way of addressing this is let's try treating the other as a human being, because you often find that behind that cloak of anonymity in the flame wars is somebody who, when you say, look, I'm a human being, you know, why did you say I'm a fucking asshole who doesn't know anything? I mean, is there a better way to say that? You go, oh, God, I just went and read what I wrote, and you're right. So if we're fighting dehumanization, one of the tools that we have is that we are human. Let's treat the other as human as well. Anyway, let's get to the other. So um, let's start with Roberto. We're bringing it your way. I appreciate the uh, panel. Uh, I noticed that some of you use the term minority. And we're talking about speech and language. I live in California. So when you say that, I really don't know what you mean. That said, it draws our attention to something that's kind of a subtext and a kind of a deep unconscious within this kind of hate field environment, which is that the kind of giant invisible elephant in the room, I think, is whiteness on hate crimes. If you look at those people that are killed, if you look at the majority of the crimes being perpetrated, they're not perpetrated by people that are purple. <laughs> they're perpetrated by people that are white. And there's something going on in white America that's run afoul. And my question is, do you think that that is relevant and matters and important and important for the discourse of hate crimes? Or does the discourse of hate crimes actually mask the role of the decline of whiteness in the United States or the decline of the Anyone want to feel that? The team. You know, Roberto, uh, thank you for what you had to say. I wish it were that simple and just white on everybody else. But in Pasadena, where I live, it's black on brown and brown on black. And so, depending on the community, it's going to be one way or the other. And it isn't just in Pasadena. It is across California as well. As you know, I'm from California. I do think that if talk, we need to really embrace anti-racism. That means embracing, I mean, excuse me, discussing and openly talking about white supremacy, just like we talk about male supremacy, heterosexual. So that's a conversation that we need to have around how whiteness is actually part of the culture that's accepted is a dehumanization culture, which is very dangerous to white people themselves. And how do we begin to have that kind of conversation instead of fear? And I think part of what we're not talking about is that people have fear of those young brown kids standing in the corner. They're scared, and that we have to say no. These are these treat them just like you would treat the, the young white kids you see, and let's invest in them. Let's give them the support services they need because they are our future. We have when you look at Patrice's film. Uh, you may be surprised to find out that what were there seven young men in the uh, attack team? Uh, they were white, they were black, and yes, some of them were Latino. Okay, so, I mean, that shows you exactly what Alex was talking about. That just think of the effect that the media is having on young people when Latino teenagers on Long Island are going out Mexican hunting. What does that tell you? Okay, this is a very vulnerable population. And also, I want to say, I, I guess I'm here what people now call pale, male, and stale. 
<laughs> well, that's describing me. And first of all, I gotta tell you, it doesn't make me feel very good. <laughs> make me feel embraced. <laughs> Uh, and also, Roberta, to your point, yes, most of the perpetrators may be white. I would argue that many, if not most of the victims, are white also. You know, women are being attacked, homosexuals. This is not just a racial issue. Thank you for your comments. I, I, um, I do think that one of the things you're talking about is something that we need to service. And this whole anxiety among particularly older people, and I think it's ramped up by hate speech about the shift in demographics and the fact that, that so-called white people are no longer going to be the majority of the United States of America. That's happening. And I do think it's part of the whip up. I mean, I think it's part of the whip up and surfacing it to me seems to be a value, let's get it out there. You wanna talk about that? Okay, I mean, talk about that. But that's, you know, I think it's this underlying thing that is going on very much in the whole shock jock field, you know, where they're, where they're talking about us versus them, et cetera. And I think, you know, the fact that you're trying to surface it, you know. I hear you, I'm from Oakland, and I'm definitely the minority as a, as a you know, Caucasian person in my town. And I actually feel quite comfortable there, but but you know, in many parts of the country, the point is is like get the conversation out there, get it out there. This you know, the election of uh, Barack Obama, um, you know, in, in reality, it, it's it was just like this this subtext that is is not on the table. And I think the more we talk about it, we get it out there, the easier it's going to be to deal with it. Because hate underneath the surface is as dangerous as hate the most. I think Roberto's point is a good one, and I, what, what kind of bothered me through this whole talk is that we hadn't really talked about why this was happening. And I, I teach and study rhetoric, and it seems to me that the otherization that has happened by our corporations and through the media has gone unchecked by journalists. So when we've got problems with unemployment, or when statistics come out that say, oh, Latinos are now rivaling African Americans for the largest minority in our country. Um, our journalists patently accept that discussion as being part of the problem instead of investigate. So when we say we're losing jobs, nobody's saying, oh, that corporation just sent hundreds of thousands abroad. We choose to blame the powerless people and otherize them. And I think that that's what's fomenting this rage and anger, and we need to, do, to dismantle that. Capitalism. <laughs> A gentleman here in a green sweater. I'm going to kind of mention the elephant that is in this World Trade Center, and that's, uh, I don't know how many of you heard of Building 7? Well, the World Trade Center, we're talking about Muslims, and Muslims hasn't been mentioned, but they have been certainly misused, and we're saying that Muslims must have brought down the World Trade Center. Well, if anyone that wants to take a look at Building 7, go to your computer, you'll find out that it's a perfect controlled demolition. And that the three buildings came down on 9-11. But this is not talked about at this open media conference. My name is Mary Rabon, and I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, one thing that I did want to just kind of emphasize is that uh, the, the minority, you know, when we use that term, it, it, it makes people sound like less than. So I try to say either not white or whatever race they might be, if I know. But, you know, I think another thing is that, no, it's not just black and brown people that are getting killed and attacked. It's black on black crime and black on brown, brown on black, everybody. But in communities where there are few to no resources, then people are striking out. They're, they're disenfranchised, they don't have jobs, they don't have anything, and so they turn to violence. And I think that what I do in my community is I try to organize the block and let the people know that you know we're all in this together. And it's very difficult sometimes, depending on whose door you knock on. But uh, I think that that one thing, that minority, if we could stop saying that, that would help a lot. Did I say it? Seriously. 
I, I don't know, but I know several people have said it. But no, I, if I did, I, you're totally right. I was completely wrong. If I said that, it was like it's not a term I usually use. And so if I did, I'm really sorry. And I, I just want people to be conscious of that. You know, if nothing else, just be conscious of that one thing. And I really think that might help. All right, we have a young lady all the way in the back with her hand up high. Yep, yep, you. And then we're going to go to her left right afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Alex, I think this question is specifically for you because you brought up my Can you introduce town, yourself, please? San Antonio. I'm getting there. I'm from San Antonio. My name is Trisha Swenson. And I want to know, because you brought up San Antonio in the recent basketball case, so with a solution in mind, what kind of coverage should the media be giving to that, and what should the public dialogue look like? Because that's not an unusual situation for us. I can tell you that I had never heard that before. This was told to us by Congressman uh, Charlie Gonzalez, who is chair of the caucus, as you know. And to me, it's such a terrible thing that you would um, cheer for one particular team because it's white and against the other team because it's brown. And chant something that has become really a situation of infamy where in Tucson, uh, in Arizona as a whole, there is so much anti-Latino fever going on, it's not even funny. So um, they need to talk about it there. I had never heard that before. You know, I've been in places where people kid about things like that, but with one another, never as a crowd chanting, you know, Arizona, Arizona. We all know what Arizona represents right now. And so for me, it's, it's offensive. Anyone else on the panel that can respond to how the media sh should cover that instance or how to promote a dialogue about something like this? One of the things I'd like to add is that I am a very proud member of the mainstream media. And that story is being covered by the Express News and by our bilingual publication, Conexion. And that's why I'm asking what what should look like in the discussion. What should the media be putting out there? And how do we engage the public in that conversation? You know, one of the good things when we had uh, private uh, public affairs on television was that these things could be pursued at the local level on a daily basis. We don't have uh, public affairs programs, or rarely anymore where there was a free exchange of dialogue going back and forth. Um, thank you for covering that at the local level, but this is something that really requires as well national coverage, because it's a phenomenon. It, it's not something that is usual, you know? And I wanted to just bring up a, a root point, is that you're all trying to figure out in this discussion today about where this comes from and when it started. I think we have to acknowledge that it started as soon as colonization happened as soon as Europe, Europeans hit this country. Um, and I think that also that this anonymity is, an anonymity issue is, yes, two things. I agree with the young woman who says that we need that in terms of people to be safety and serves a purpose. But I don't think that people um, hide behind anonymity uh, at all. And I think that, um, especially it's prevalent online, two cases in point. Uh, recently, a UCA, UCLA student group, or no, University of Cal Long Beach student newspaper, wrote a horrendous article, quote unquote article, uh, covering a pow that happened that was put on there by the student group. It went viral. Um, I received it on Facebook from one of my friends. We had uh, people responding from all over the globe in response to their coverage to this student editor. Um, people wrote letters, people were calling the university, people were calling the journalists in the area. So this is an issue where it's not just limited, you're really talking about broadcast and outlets, it's really also, you have to think about in terms of how this hate speech is also prevalent online. The other case in point is the recent YouTube posting by a young woman called Asians in the Newsroom, which was brought to my attention by my good friend Gil Asakawa of AAJA. Um, I think that these, these situations are so prevalent that people aren't hiding by you know, blank, uh, unknown names. It's out there. We have to acknowledge that it's out there. So I think we have to get real and realize until we really look at the colonization that has happened in this country, and it's a global issue, that we're not going to get anywhere in this discussion. Right near the middle of the room with the gray. I 
just have a question. We were talking about mechanisms. And I'm curious about what the, what the whole group thinks about something called groupthink. In that, you know, you, you think that you're right because your group is right. And you think anybody that doesn't agree with your group is wrong. It seems like it's a mechanism in gang violence and also in that basketball game. And I just wondered what everybody thinks about that. You want to try to respond? I, I, in the, uh, the, a scene in, in our most recent film is, is the young people, the high school students, who are talking about this murder that took place in Patchogue, New York, and the students in the school are, are talking about how this could have happened. And, and one of the students in the classroom says, you know, we have this, this thing where everybody has to think the same, and then if you, if you try to speak up about it in the school, then everybody thinks you're wrong. And, and you know, how could this have taken place where these groups of young people would roam the streets of a town looking for Mexicans to beat up, and none of the young people told? They knew, but they didn't tell. And I think it is, I think it, 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 it does address what you're talking about, this group thing where, you know, we may know it's wrong, we may know that these, you know, that this is absolutely wrong, but we can't step out of the norms of our social sector or we are threatened ourselves. I mean, I, I think it's fundamental and I think, you know, addressing that is absolutely crucial to fighting it. I think it's important for us to uh, raise the uh, alarm about this increasing Islamophobia that's out here in, in America. Oklahoma just recently uh, voted to, to ban something called Sharia law as if it's a a threat um, in Oklahoma and also in Tennessee. They made any any uh, advocacy of Sharia law akin to uh, uh, treason. Uh, Fifteen years in jail, and that and that means that anyone who goes to a mosque, for example, to participate in a wedding or anything that has some relationship to the legal aspect of Islam is a uh, can possibly be in prison for fifteen years. And I don't think we're focusing enough on this. Uh, this rise of Islamophobia. I think during the, the so-called um, uh, the, the mosque, the, the, the World Trade Center mosque thing, uh, there was a lot more awareness of the issue, but it's, it's dipping beneath our consciousness now. I think we need to put a light on it. Agreed. But we actually at NHMC joined a campaign, What Unites Us. You can Google it and, and find it online, but it's addressing exactly this issue. Um, do you want to respond, Larry? I just want to respond by wholeheartedly uh, endorsing what Celine said. I mean, I think that this is, uh, at least according to statistics I've seen, the percentage of increase is highest of hate crimes against uh, Muslims here in the United States at the moment. And it certainly, uh, and you know, largely remains unaddressed. Now, you know, the, the so-called 9-11 mosque, Okay, that's, that's another thing. This rebranding, you know, we're talking about hate speech. It's also important to examine the actual language because these people are very cleverly using language to quote unquote rebrand things. I mentioned shamnesty before. You know, the, what is that? The amnesty, the amnesty bill. No, it's a shamnesty bill. Well, it wasn't even an amnesty bill. But all of a sudden, you're thinking it's amnesty because they created this word and they repeated it endlessly. And the same thing is happening. So the 9-11 mosque was another example. It wasn't a 9-11 mosque. It was just, that was made up by a couple of, in my, my opinion, insane bloggers who the mainstream media then elevated, like Pamela Geller, you know, to being experts of some kind. On the other hand, I do want to give a shout out to our mayor in New York City, Mayor Mike Bloomberg. I, I have a lot of difficulties with, uh, with Mayor Bloomberg, but he was one of the, the only public officials to stand up and be very forthright on that issue of the 9-11 uh, mosque. And, and I wonder where uh, President Obama was. I didn't hear his voice either. The people charged with recording the numbers are the FBI. You all know that, right? But what very few people know is that the numbers that they get across the country are voluntary city numbers. In other words, cities don't have to give those numbers. Pasadena, California, we have a lot of hate crime going on between browns and blacks. 
They're not reported, and they're not reported because Pasadena doesn't have want to have the reputation of having those kinds of problems. So, also, a lot of people will not report those crimes. The undocumented are not going to go to the authorities and say, I was assaulted because I'm a Mexican. They're not going to do that. They're afraid of deportation. So the numbers, you know, are very fluid. And it doesn't become a who suffers the most or whatever. We're all suffering. We're all suffering. So we, the numbers are only a small indicator of what is going on in the all right, we have two minutes left. I'm going to get to two questions. I promise this gentleman and then Monica. Sorry, I wish we could stay here forever. And I'm sure the panelists will stick around and chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. Hi, Cosmo from Seattle. We see this hate speech and incitement to commit violence by U.S. politicians, both against an anti-immigrant speech and also in the recent case of WikiLeaks against Julian Assange. Is there some way that we can hold people that engage in this type of speech accountable for that? Yes. Yeah, there's something every two years. I go to the election. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not being uh, you know, facile in answering you. I think it's a great question, but I think that's the starting point. You know, I don't think it's uh, an accident that Marcelo Lucero was killed in Patchogue, Long Island, and then we have Representative Peter King, the head now of the Homeland Security Committee and House of Representatives, holding these ludicrous hearings, exactly what Salim was talking about, singling out Muslims, you know, as being the source of terrorism. Uh, and we've had these same, very same shock jocks that I wrote about in this book going after Representative Ellison, who's one of the two Muslims who actually, actually is a representative in this country. And he represents the proud state of Minnesota, if I have that correct. So let's hear a shout out for, for the Muslim representatives and opposing to Senator Peter King. So, you know, I don't know where you live, but if you live in Peter King's district, I'd say start agitating right now to get somebody else to represent you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close with a question from Monica. and a question. Uh, my name is Monica Navoa. I'm with the Applied Research Center and ColorLines.com. Um, we are a racial justice think tank and racial justice magazine, and we're currently running the campaign Drop the I-Word um, to, um, to get the media to stop calling people illegals. Um, illegals really is the linchpin in all of these hate crimes and all of this anti-immigrant legislation and in the retelling of the American story that den denies that this, has, this country has always been um, in a state of becoming um, and who, who is it that, that has made this country what it is. Um, in all, all marginalized people have been, um, have been called horrible things. The N-word um, was the excuse for Jim Crow. Um, people being on reservations were called, before they were put on reservations, were called savages. Um, and so this is something that we've faced before, and we have an opportunity to change that now, but we need to talk about race explicitly, right? And I, I invite all of you to ask these really uncomfortable questions, because part of what we're doing with this campaign is, well, a lot of people will say, you know, people are called the I word because they've committed a crime, because they've broken a law. Well, our laws are inhumane, and so we need to call them into question, and we need people asking those questions because, what you know, the underpinnings of this whole messed up and broken system, it's, it's our, you know, it's capitalism. It's this racial hierarchy. It's, um, it's the future, and we need, we need to, I want to hear the uncomfortable questions, because the room has, I don't know, please, like, reach out to us at dropthe-i-word.com um, and ask those questions. But I want to hear from you all on the panel how you're creating these safe spaces to have these uncomfortable confrontations between communities and people who know that it feels wrong to talk this way but have a lot of questions about the systems at work. I think this word is probably one of the most important dynamic words for us to examine at this moment. And uh, 
Um, Louder, in our, please. In, in our film, there's um, it's one of the things that, that the community of Patchogue addresses. They they um, they make a resolution um, saying that they're going to be careful about how um, immigrants are spoken about. And you know, the mayor, in this case, says that he is not going to use this term anymore. That he really doesn't think because he gives us a wrong message to children. And I, you know, I do think it's it's a conversation. If you really want dialogue and you really want people to open it up and have this discussion, in communities across the country, it is one of the most difficult discussions. It is not like instantly, oh yeah, I get it. I don't think that because people really, you know, have this sense that there's the law, et cetera, and the rule of law and believing in the rule of law. So I think if you if you open up the conversation as a dynamic one and let people be uncomfortable and not just sort of shun them as they open up the conversation, then real change or real discussion can come out. But I think if it, if it becomes this thing where you, if you say a word like that, that you're the enemy, then we can't really have the dialogue. So thank you for opening this discussion. I think it's a really, really important one that will allow people to, to have, have a talk about it and, and to really think about what it means. Having a petition of inquiry at the SCC is very uncomfortable for them. It's very uncomfortable because First Amendment folks um, are going to react. But remember always that we have the right to ask our federal institutions to intercede when we have problems of the magnitude that we have right now. And it's a magnitude where people are getting killed right and left. And right, something else while I'm thinking about it. You know, Many of the people that are getting killed from back east are not even Mexican. It's only Ecuadorians. And yet, it's lumped, they're all lumped into one category, and that's Mexican this and Mexican that. Now, it is because of the fact that we are 70% of all American Latinos, any Latino living within the United States. But nevertheless, it doesn't take away from the fact that we have to make these people very uncomfortable by saying very loudly and very clearly by every means available to us that this has got to stop and that we need relief that they have to study that problem so that in fact we have remedies. And I'm not talking about rules or regulations. I'm talking about what is the problem so that we can address it. Other than that, we're just talking. All right, thank you. It's been a great panel. Thank you to our, to our panelists and to our wonderful audience.